Okay, let's see here. Let's get going. I think we're live. We just gotta wait a few seconds here for it to go. Wonder who will be here first. Nobody yet. We will see what happens. We got a like. Fantastic. Who's going to comment first? There's people here. Who's going to comment first today? We'll find out. Still waiting. Oh, 40 seconds. Oh, it's like a tie. Oh, so many people are here already. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, it's been about a minute, so um, that should be... Enough time for that Facebook notification to make it through. So, welcome. We are uh, still in Genesis uh, today. So, um, I very much appreciate you joining us today. Let me get this all squared away. Uh, where do I put that? Put that up there. So, um, Genesis 9 and 10 is where we are today and maybe we'll get into 11 I don't know I I expect um, I expect Genesis chapter 10 to go pretty quick um, but we will just have to wait and and see on that one um, I just gotta figure out where to put all the stuff so that I can see what I'm doing um, so let's pull up the text here i moved myself down to the lower so we can uh keep track of where everything is here um so genesis 9 um god blessed noah and his sons and said to them uh be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth okay it's it's uh we've um it's sort of a Genesis reset here. So um, the promise and blessing that was given to Adam and Eve is now uh, given to uh, Noah and his sons. Um, and everything sort of, if we want to think about it, got reset with the flood. Um, so everything in the creation uh, in Genesis 1 verses 1 is talked about, you know, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. Um, and then the spirit was over the waters. Um, so also in the flood, everything is sort of restored to its watery state. And from that watery state comes the new creation, um, which Noah and his sons will bring about. Um, again, it's no better than the first creation. Um, all is a sign of um, salvation uh, from sin and, and death um, as a sign of that judgment is going to come. Um, but we'll... we'll keep going on here so uh genesis 9 verse 2 the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every uh beast of the the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given every moving thing that lives shall be for food as i gave you the green plants i give you everything uh, so this would be the, the, you know, why are animals suddenly afraid of people? Um, well, it's kind of hard to, there's a small number of animals that we haven't either eaten or tried to eat. So they're all afraid that we're going to eat them. Um, that's pretty much what it is. Um, that's, that's the reasoning behind it. Um, but, um, uh, you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. So not supposed to eat um, eat blood. Um, this, this gets brought back in Leviticus. Um, and this has to do with, well, um, well many things. Uh, it could be a foreshadowing of, of the sacrament. Uh, but more likely it has to do with how you know, in pagan religions, blood is very important in their sacrifices, and there's there's a perceived power in blood, um, and so to sort of avoid that is is the Lord doing that. That's that's definitely what it is in Leviticus. Um, 
uh, and whether or not how that applies here, um, it definitely they're echoing each other. Uh, Nine verse five. Um, and for your uh, lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. So here, um, judgment, there is a, a reckoning uh, for spilling a man's blood. And then we get this, uh, this poetry here. Um, and here, this... Uh, we will, before talking about this verse, uh, maybe you've heard pastors talk about this before, that there's a thing called a, a chiasm or a chiasm. It's kind of pronounced both ways. Um, and here is an example of that. Um, so whoever um, sheds the blood of man, by man will his blood be shed. Um, so that, that is a chiasm. So the, it sort of works, it, it goes in and comes back out the same way. So whoever sheds is the first part of it. Then the second part is blood. And then of man is the third part. One, two, three. And then you do the opposite as you go out. Three by man shall his blood to be shed one. And it makes it memorable. Um, that's why they do it. And that's why there's that structure so that it's poetic and it sticks in your brain. Um, but why? For um, God made man in his own image. And um, that's okay. I just want to double check a trans... Uh, this is better. The New King James Version is a little bit better. Um, so, for God made man in his own image. It really is um, literally... For in the image of God, he made man or Adam. Um, and the ESV doesn't like that because um, it's, it's clunky, and which is odd for the ESV because sometimes it's clunky. Um, but here it seems as if God is talking about himself in the third person. And actually here we see a veiled reference to the Trinity yet again. So God made... So in the image of God... He made man. So who made? The God did. So God made man. Why are you talking that way? Why does God choose to reveal himself that way? Because the son is uh, the image of God. And so he is, that's the, the, the idea that's going on here, is that um, the son creates, and, the, and, and then in reference to the father, and the spirit's there too. So that's why there's this, sort of God speaking about himself in the third person. Um, so don't don't kill people, but rather, um, and you, um, uh, and you, or but you. So the idea here is don't kill people, but rather be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth, and multiply on it. Okay. So don't kill people, uh, but rather uh, be fruitful and multiply. Um, again, this is an interactive Bible study. So if you've got questions, pop it in the, uh, the comments section. I will get to it as soon as I can. If not, I'm sure... One of the HT people will send me a text if I have missed a question. So I'll keep my phone out so that it it vibrates. I see it. Um, 9 verse 8. Then God uh, said to Noah and to his sons with him. So here again is being tied to Noah. Um, that That's continually the refrain throughout the flood. Is that you're on the ark with Noah. So you're tied to Noah, and that's the important thing. So here also, he's speaking to Noah and to his sons who are with him. So again, they are tied back to Noah. That's the important uh, uh, marker. Is who, Whose name do you got? And his sons have Noah's name. Uh, so also you and me, we have Christ's name. We bear, or the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because uh, in holy baptism, God gave us his name. 
And what does he say? Um, look, I am establishing my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Um, and with every um, living thing which is with you. Again, here the animals are with, with Noah. Got to be tied to Noah. The birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. And then here it's, it's, the sh it's shifting to not just Noah singular, but those after Noah. Um, and here again, um, offspring is... Um, is singular so here this is a reference to christ so again cr there's going to be a seed after him who will be re who will restore all things um whatever came out with you from uh going out from the ark all uh it is for every beast of the earth and i establish my covenant with you god's very repetitive here very important um this lets you know that it's super important what the Lord is saying. So super repetitive means super important. I established my covenant with you. What is it? Um, I will never again uh, shall be all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Yeah, so there's not going to be a, a flood that's going to take out everything. He doesn't say there won't be floods. Uh, it's just that the flood won't won't take anything out. Um, and now, ooh, good gift here in this text. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and between you, and between all uh, living things which are with you to the gener to the forever generation for all for ge for all future generations for for a, an eternal generation it's an eternal promise um and what is this so this is important because for us especially as lutherans um sometimes we, we talk about the sacraments um and we um we sort of seem to be foreign to lots of other Christians. Um, and God attaches his word to something. That's exactly what's... So God has made a promise, a word of God, and now he attaches something um, that you can see, a sign that you can look at. Um, and this isn't to try and get into any sort of weird uh, philosophy about this stuff, which the church has done in the past. Uh, this is just simply to say, God says a thing, and then God puts a thing that you can look at and remember the thing God said. Uh, that is, have faith in the thing that God said. Um, but it's, well, the the covenant, the sign of the covenant isn't just for uh, for us, but we'll get there. Um, so what is this sign? My bow I have set in the heavens, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and between the earth. So here God, um, yes, Pastor Burger has put the, the rainbow here, and that is true. I mean, that's sort of what it's tied to. Um, but the image here is literally of a bow, that God is taking his bow, like that he would normally... Um, be a, has aimed at the earth up to this point. So, like, the, the, the image is God has taken his weapon of war and hung it up on the wall. That's where he puts it. So he takes his bow that he had aimed at the earth, struck the earth, and then he's like, no, look, I've taken my bow and I've hung it up. It is not going to be, I'm not going to take it off the wall anymore. Um, and... So God is no longer at war with the earth. And um, and it's, let's see here, and um, 9 verse 14, And it shall happen when I bring clouds upon the earth, uh, the bow will be seen in the clouds. 
okay? It will be seen. And here's a here's a passive, the bow and the bow is seen in the clouds. But it was seen by whom? I will remember my covenant that is between me, between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When uh, the boat is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant be between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So God ties his word to a physical thing. Well, I mean, I guess if we want to use science, it's not really physical, but I think you know what I mean. So there's there's a something that can be observed or or received with the senses that is tied to his word, his word of promise. And that's what's happening here with the bow or the rainbow. Um, and so God is going to look at this and, and remember. So here we can, well, that's kind of an interesting way of saying, and yes, we can take comfort from this too, but the comfort really for us is that we can actually rub God's nose in his promises. So we, we can throw God's word back at him. Um, the psalmists do this from, from time to time. We can throw God's promises back at him. But you said... Um, and, 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 a, um, Moses does this with, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when God wants to destroy the Israelites. He says, you need to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the, basically the covenant you made with them. So, um, here again, this is how we view the sacraments today. It's the same thing that's set up here in Genesis. The theology that we have as Lutherans is not foreign to the scriptures. The idea that well, why do you need some sort of physical sign? Well, that's what God set up with the, the, the rainbow after the flood. This is no different. And besides the fact that the flood is a foreshadowing of holy baptism. Um, yes, we Oh, yes, Pastor, Pastor Borgart, that's very helpful. We can rub God's nose in his promises um, so that his nose is no longer burning anger at us. Um so that his his nose is soothed um and his he is a, his face rather turned towards us in blessing um and here again when the bow is in the clouds verse 16 here um this is another important one um that i will remember and this is god talking i will remember the covenant between god and every living creature so here again, you get this moment where God talks about himself in this weird third person way. Um, and this again is a reference to, um, there's this covenant between, um, I guess if we want to dive into it, would be like the between the father and the earth and the son is the messenger of that covenant. The son who is um, delivering this sign that we are to look at and remember the promise God the Father has made to the earth. Um, in the same way, um, it's baptism, but also the cross, the cross that is in the clouds of heaven, where the sun is placed in between earth and heaven, where God is. And so that God will seize his son um, and doesn't smite the earth. Um, that's, that's what's going on at Calvary, that there's the son and the Father sees the son and then is no longer angry with, with the earth, but has mercy. <clears throat> uh, decorative bow. Um, no, Richard, um, there's really just uh, one, one word for that. And um, it's really, I mean, there's only one idea is like a battle bow. It's just the idea. Um, so his weapon of war, he hangs up. Um, Kevin and I have established. Okay. <sighs> the sons of Noah, who went forth from the ark, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. 
and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Um, okay. Uh, okay. And now we get to see, um, so like I said before, um, the state of man is not the same, is not different after the flood. Um, so before the flood, um, so before the flood, mankind is evil. Everything he wants to do is only evil all the time. So God is determined to, uh, he hates sin, he hates sinners. That's just the language of the scriptures. But God had made a promise to save sinners, and so he's going to hold to his promise. Um, and so he has mercy on Noah and his family. But then after, God says, well, I'm not going to destroy the earth anymore, even though uh, the intentions of man's hearts, the desires of your heart, are, are evil from, from youth. So man is no different. And, just, and this is the story where we get to see that play out. What does that look like? What does it look like that um, Adam and Eve are now enemies of God? You will you get the Cain you get Cain and Abel. How do you see that the desires of man's hearts are evil? Well, now you get this story about Noah and his sons. Well, specifically um, his son Ham and what goes on here. Um, so Noah began uh, to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank from the wine and became drunk and he lay out uh naked in the midst of his tent um so yeah that's not a good way to start a story um you kind of know that this is this is only if this is the start of the story and this is pretty um bottom of the hill it's only going to get worse um you get that too um oh it's in exodus where it talks about oh there was the son um, there was an Israelite whose father was an Egyptian. That's how the, the, the story starts. And you go, that's not going to end well. It didn't. He ended up getting stoned to death. Um, and then you get it with, with David and Bathsheba. In the time of year when kings go out to war, uh, David sent Joab, but David stayed at the castle. So here again is that sort of story. Noah drank from the wine, became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent, in the midst of his tent. Um, if we're going to... So we see Noah, um, I guess, the text doesn't say this, is that um, is to be merc for us to be, be merciful with Noah, um, sort of like Shem and Japheth are, uh, we'll get there, um, because... I mean, you have to think about it from Noah's perspective is everything's been destroyed. And yes, God has saved you, but like everything you knew was destroyed. Um, maybe some survivor's guilt. We have that too. And Noah copes with that in a way that is not helpful. Um, but it's very, you know, and this this would also huh, brings us to the, the the historicity of the text. So if you go to other religious texts, um, or stories about founders, um, we don't really like, they never really like talking about the faults of their patriarchs or the fathers of the peoples. But the scriptures are full of that. We see the, the people of God for who they are, sinners. Time and time again, we see that they are sinners and that the Lord saves sinners. That's what it's all, that's what it's all about. So what's going on here? So, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two, and announced it, um, declared it to his two brothers outside the tent. Um, some would want to tie this to a passage about, a passage in Leviticus, because um, it talks about the nakedness of father there. The problem is the euphemism there is uncovering the nakedness, 
and this is seeing the nakedness. So it's it's two different um, it's two different ways of speaking. Um, so what does Ham do with the sin of his father? He announces it. Um, he, he announces it. He preaches it. He preaches the sin of his father. That's what Ham does. That's the sort of preacher Ham is. He preaches sin and exposes sin to the, um, with no, that's, it's just, yeah, that's what he's doing. Um, but what do Shem and Japheth do? Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on, uh, their two shoulders and they walked backwards and they covered the nakedness of their father. Um, and they, um, and their, and their faces, um, were not towards their father's nakedness and they didn't see it. Um, they turned around backwards. Yep. So, um, and this is the difference between Shem and Japheth. So, so Shem is the, is the, is the leader here who, who comes first is kind of important in certain cases uh, in the scripture. Actually, I would say most of the time. Uh, so, for example, um, if we were to go to Exodus and talk about when Aaron and Miriam uh, get really upset at Moses because he marries a, a, a Cushite woman, um, the text begins, Miriam and Aaron grumbled against Moses. And so there you sort of get the feeling, well, Miriam started it. And then Aaron, as is usual with Aaron, uh, goes along with the crowd. Anyway, Shem and Japheth here, Shem is not a preacher of uncovering the sin, especially of his father, but of anyone. Rather, he is a minister who covers sin. Um, he covers it up um, and would not do anything to expose his father's sin to anybody. Um, he's got... Uh, uh, the seal won't be broken by Pastor uh, Shem. Uh, Shem will, will lock that up tight, uh, cover it up, and won't even look, won't even think about it anymore. That's the type of preacher Shem is. Um, so here, if we, we want to, we get the flavor of two different churches yet again in Genesis. We have the church of Ham and the church of Shem. Uh, and the church of Ham is one where um, sin is announced and well is there really anything Noah can do about it not so much I mean what's the point um, but Shem is one who covers sin 24 Noah uh, well he gets back up and um, from his wine and he knew uh, what had been done to him by his younger son his youngest son. And so what does he say? Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he will be to his brothers. Um, another curse used to justify racism, slavery in the past too. Yeah, that's not good. Um, even the servants of servants can be saved. Hmm. That's that's throughout the New Testament. Um and here this is this is not racial but rather um spiritual. That's what's going on here. Um and because he continues. And blessed be the uh, be Yahweh, Jesus, God of Shem. And Canaan will be his servant. Um, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Um, and if we wanted to equate this to, to Israel, which is, um, you would sort of see this being set up in terms of um, uh, the, the Levites. So there's the, there's the different groups of Levites um, well, there's Israelites who aren't Levites, and then there's Levites, and then there's the high priest family. And I, this is where that would 
this is where that would um, sort of relate because again they're all meant to be together they're all meant to be together shem ham and japheth aren't meant to be separate um there's just this relationship of of who is sort of i guess um who's the high priest who's the preacher and that would be shem and japheth and 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 canaan and and uh ham after his father are then sort of lined up that way so this would be sort of the um oh the submission order to using that word submission like it is in ephesians um five how are people lined up in the kingdom well this this is how it's getting laid out uh, after the flood, Noah lived not 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. That's a long life. Hmm. Okay. And here we get more genealogies. Um, we get the genealogies of Japheth and Ham, and we'll get Shem later, and then we'll get a genealogy for Abraham and, um, oh, the sons of Israel. And this is where these genealogies are trying to figure out, well, who is the, the seed? I mean, this is what it said, your seed after you. So the offspring are important. Where is the, the offspring going to come from? So there was, um, Adam and Eve thought it was, well, one, they thought that Abe, uh, Cain was the seed, the promised one, because the Lord isn't slow in keeping his promises, right? Um, and then you get, well, that's not right. Then you get his genealogy and the genealogy of Seth. And then here you get another, like an expansion of the, the families, and then it gets narrowed. It gets narrowed to eventually Abraham, um, where then that the promise of the seed is made yet again. Um, so that's the point of all these genealogies, is where is the Savior coming, and who is he saving? Well, he's saving, um, he's saving Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is why... Um, it's like, there's Shem, and let Japheth and Ham to, and Canaan dwell in his tent. Let them be there with Shem, because from him is the blessing, as we'll come to see it when we get to his genealogy. Uh, and we'll just sort of... The sons of Japheth, Gomer, uh, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarmah. The sons of Javan, uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Katim, and Dod Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. So here we're getting a, f a little bit of foreshadowing um, of what's coming next here in this languages and clans and nations. Um, and Genesis likes to do this. This is why... You have Genesis 1 creation account followed by a Genesis 2 creation account. And here again, we'll get a genealogy that, that talks about things like languages and clans and nations. Then you're, we're going to get Tower of Babel, and then we'll get another genealogy backing it back up. So it's this back and forth. Coastlands Tarshish, this is uh, the same sort of region where... Um, um, Jonah tries to flee. Sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So Cush is south of Egypt, um, and then there's Egypt um, and Canaan. So all the, the peoples of the earth, eventually they started from one individual or one family group. Um, that's kind of what we're learning here and where all the these nations came from. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabtang, Rama, and Sabteka. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Didan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was uh, first on the earth to be a mighty man. Um, 
He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. So Nimrod is a mighty man. He's a warrior. He's a warrior and a hunter. That's verse 8. Um, warrior and a hunter. And you're like you want to be like him. And what did he do? Um, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From there he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ir, Kalah, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalah. That is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrushim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. So here, um, Babel is, is mentioned for the first time. And then Akkadia, which is another ancient um, empire. And then Assyria is another empire. Nineveh, we know, capital of Assyria. Um, so here, those big nations all come from Nimrod, um, which sets him up um, in sort of Mesopotamia. That's where all these are. Um, then the Philistines. Um, they are, um, well, they're a thorn in the side of the Israelites, aren't they? And here we, we get them first mentioned. What about Canaan? Well, he fathered Sidon, his firstborn. And there's a, a city, Sidon, right there on the coast of the Mediterranean. And Heth. And the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. After that, afterward, the, the clans of, Canaan's, of the Canaanites dispersed. So they were together and they spread out. And the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Whew. So yeah. Yeah, well, they were very busy. Um... So let's keep rolling. We'll just get through this. Um, to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpachshad fathered Shalah, and Shalah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. Okay, so here again, more foreshadowing. Eber, this is from the, the name from which they get Hebrew, um, sons of Eber. Um, and then Peleg, the day, the, in his days the earth was divided. Um, here's foreshadowing of the division that happens after Babel. So we got, if we wanted to, we're not really told the ages here. Um, yeah, I need a flowchart. Tell me about it, um, Suzanne. It's a little, it's a little rough to keep keep going. Um, but here again, um, Eber. So Hebrew, we're 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 to somebody important. Things are going to start getting narrowed down. And that's what's important here is, we're we're trying to see where all the nations are. How do how do all of the peoples of the earth relate? Um, and they do all relate. It's not an abstract idea. They really are from all one people. But the idea here is not just trying to figure out a genealogical sort of thing, like, you know, so that we can have the biblical equivalent of, you know, 23andMe or Ancestry.com. Like, it's not really, you know, that's not the point. The point is, who is God saving and where is the Savior coming from? That's what all these genealogies are about. And so... Um, Eber, Hebrew, well, that would be the God's promised people. We're not quite there yet completely, um, at least in this story. Um, but since they're all related to, to all the other peoples, that Savior really is for everyone. Um, Peleg, earth was divided. Uh, Joktan. Joktan fathered uh, Almodad, Shalef, Hazar, Mavith, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Job, 
Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Safar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So these are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations and from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So um, how does everyone relate to Noah? That's what's going on here because from Noah is the promise. And we'll see in the next chapter that... Um, that this promise goes through the sons of Seth, or not Seth, Shem. Well, it goes through Seth, but um, it goes through Shem. Uh, because from Shem eventually comes Abram. And and that's the that's where this is all heading. Um, so we don't want to lose sight of that. I, I know it's, you know, rough going with how to pronounce those names and sort of like, you know, what's the point of all this? Again, it's all tying us to Jesus and how Jesus relates to us. And that Jesus really is the savior of the whole world because we're all from the same stock. Um, sometimes I think we abstract. Uh, we think in different categories now. Um, we think of just human beings as a, you know, just sort of an entity, a thing, humanity or something. Uh, but really, we are all related. And we are all related to Jesus. And that's the important thing. That he is one with us. He He is our brother in a true and real sense. That he came from somewhere as we come from somewhere. And if we were to back the train up far enough, we would, we would see um, how we tie in um, to the family tree of Jesus. And in the family tree of Jesus is salvation. Well, there's salvation for all who are in the family tree of Jesus by faith in him. It's not related. It's not by blood. Um, though the, the Jews of Jesus, they tried that. Um, it's a matter of faith in that promise of who is this savior. And, and what is he saving us from? He's coming to, to rescue us from the devil, to cover our shame, to cover our sin, uh, to forgive us our sins, um, and to raise us from the dead. Um, and we see pictures of that in what the Lord does for Adam and Eve. Um, I'll make myself bigger. That way I'm talking because I'm just talking about looking at the text. Um, we see that in what the Lord does for Adam and Eve. He clothes them. He makes a sacrifice for them. Um, and then there's sacrifices after that. Um, he puts up a, even though mankind hasn't changed, the Lord makes a promise nonetheless. And he holds himself to that promise. And we can hold him to that promise. That there will be not only not a flood, but a Savior is going to come. And, and that Savior is going to come through the line of Shem. And Shem was a preacher of the covering of sin. The covering of nakedness. Um, so that we would not you know, be ridiculed in public. But rather, um, we would be looked at as um, forgiven. Forgiven fathers, forgiven sons, forgiven neighbors. Um, because that's what the scriptures are all about. The salvation won and accomplished in Jesus. And that salvation, that forgiveness being delivered to sinners who need it. Noah didn't need anybody to proclaim his sins. He needed somebody to cover his sins. Even though he was in the midst of his tent in his sin. There went, um, there went Shem right into the midst of his father's sin. Not looking at it uh, with respect, but to cover his father's sin. That's what Shem does. Um, and thanks be to God, we still have preachers who do that today. And really all Christians can do that. And that was the, the gospel lesson. Um, well, in the historic lectionary this past week in Luke chapter, um, chapter 6, where um, be merciful as your, heavenly fa as your father is merciful. And that's what Shem does. He's merciful to his father, um, as the heavenly father is merciful to them. Um, and Japheth along with him. So Shem's the preacher, Japheth like his congregation. If we wanna if we wanna sort of push it, push the analogy a little bit a little bit farther, um, 
we could see it that way, that those who are members of the, the church of Shem, where there's a preacher of who covers sin, they also cover the sins of their neighbors. And that's what we do as Christians, because Christ has covered our sin. He puts a sign, put sign, um, things we can hear, see, touch, and taste to deliver his, his covenant, his promise to us. Um, baptism, absolution, preaching, his, the supper of his body and blood. And all this is foreshadowed and, and promised here in, uh, in Genesis. That we're not, our theology that we have is thoroughly biblical. It's not just Lutheran or New Testament y, it's Old Testament y too. Um, all here with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Anyway, I don't have anything else. Um, I believe Pastor Borkart will be with you tomorrow. I hope so. Um, so until I, I'm here with you, just, you know, give Pastor Borgard, you know, be nice to him, I guess, if you have to. Have a good day.